Okay, one, two. Multiplex thing you can do. Well, um, ah, we're in. We're live, live and direct. So go ahead and ask your question now. Okay. Um, so for question twenty, it said Jim Crow referred to what exactly? Uh huh. Um, at first, you know, I I thought, well, the answer is American apartheid. To me, it's a, between American apartheid or a mythical figure out of American ministry, uh -huh. minstrelsy. Mm hmm Because uh, minstrelsy, yeah. Min and. Um, I thought at first it was American apartheid, of course, but at the same time, the last PowerPoint slide that you gave us, mm -hmm. you made it a point to point out that it was um, the Hop and Jim Crow guy that like went mm -hmm. over in America mm -hmm. um, talking about that. So I was a little confused with I, if I if you if there was E selecting both, that's what I would have done. But right. Well, okay. so then. So, two, two so what, what, that, what that illustrates, um, because one of your classmates came with another question like about 15 minutes ago, and I said, African Americans are tricky. So you have to understand that there's going to be, an, there might be multiple answers possible, and that you might have to consider both of them as possibilities and act upon them. So... If you do have to select one, then select the broadest one that's most applicable to the current situation. All right? So you have to understand that, yes, there was a historical person who acted out Jim Crow, right? For minstrelsy, making fun of black people. There was a historical reason for that, right? There was a person who actually did that. And then that basically got copied by various other people. But then that became a model for basically ridiculing black people that some black people kind of took on. As in, for example, the movie Bamboozled, where it's a mythical network, but you have people acting that kind of buffoonery out. So just like that mythical show in Bamboozled on a fox light network, because it would be like a fox light network that would put something like that on, yeah, that, that spike is basically saying, yeah, that could be a reality. Now, how is reality show, reality TV any different? You know, find me a man, you know, flavor flay, you know, and certain, you know, Oh, who, who are these people, right? Why does Magic Johnson have to, you know, as a counter to that, have to create a whole network called the Spire, which is basically old, uh, old school black television? Like today, you know, I'm wearing my, what, you know, what my wife calls the Cosby look. You know, like, okay, those, those sweaters. And I said, Bill Cosby is gangster, okay? Because by Im embodying an intelligent black professional, right, an intact black nuclear family where they're both professionals, and yeah, they had a kid who may have acted up, but there was an expectation of intelligence. So what's wrong with that? Being college pro, yeah, okay, it's like dumpy, frumpy, whatever, you know, I, I, I could dress hipper, but it's raining. Right, and the, and Cosby, quiet as it's kept, like funded Spike Lee's Malcolm X because he couldn't get mainstream funding for telling the story about Malcolm X, even though it was a Hollywoodized movie. Well, there's, there's two words in your question that make it make it want, that indicate what 
which you're not yes. looking for, and the words are referred and exactly. Yeah. So yes. Sure. So you, you referred to exactly. So that is a you know yeah. phrases of art which kind of give away the answer, but. You know, we want to look at, okay, this, uh, this policy of apartheid in America. That's what he is in Yeah. That's, so, and, yeah, go ahead. That's the meaning of the hidden service. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm going to, because uh, I'm looking at uh, both the syllabus and deciding to go to backtrack a little bit to talk about a concept that nobody really was talking about so much at the time, or the people that were talking about it at the time um, weren't really being paid attention to because of, uh, well, you'll see. And I'll, I'll just talk about that in a second. So there's a brother who uh, re died in the last decade, Paulo Freire or Freire, however you want to pronounce it, a Brazilian educator who uh, wrote two books at least, uh, The Pedagogy of the Pressed and also The Pedagogy of Hope. So understanding what a pedagogy is, it's not only a theory of how you educate, but it's also what you educate. And so within his framework, he's saying there's two purposes for education, domestication and liberation. So the culture that generates this classroom with the Columbus discovered America narrative is domestication. It's producing domesticated citizens out of people who have a wild human nature that might not necessarily be <laughs> domesticated. Okay, because the natural condition of human beings is freedom, and so they react to oppression. But how you react to oppression and how you are oppressed might vary. All right, so the pedagogy of the press is he's basically saying, okay, so one purpose, because remember, he's a university trained. Professor and Marxist. So he's basically going to say, hmm, we need to question the way we're educating people. He's also a so Socratic scholar. And also a Socratic scholar, very well read, right? So Socrates taught by posing questions. What kind of questions? Who can pose questions? And who can answer them? So to take a Frarean approach is basically to say, well, anybody who has language can pose questions. And so what Fra Paolo was saying is the oppressed people can also have a knowledge base and a wisdom that's not necessarily recognized by the educational system. It might, in fact, be invisible. And so one of the things he wanted people to look at is how do you educate yourself to liberate yourself? Because he's saying the educational system is kind of owned part and parcel by the oppressor, you know, and so are you going to conform to the oppressor's point of view and, you know, get a job, or are you going to try and transform society? It is no accident that many liberation movements came out of student activism. It's not an accident, okay? Because students, by design, ask questions, and they ask hard questions that may or not be able to be answered. That's what makes them dangerous and wonderful, right? So, so this is first uh, published in Portuguese in the late 60s, translated into English in the 70s, where a lot of uh, people who were training to become educators started reading that stuff and attempted to apply it uh, in what we often refer to as liberation schools. Um, definitely in the 60s and 70s, and uh, a lot of it disappeared only to reappear in what I was going to be showing you, what I started to show you um, Monday, and uh, we'll continue that. But before that, we're going to look at some of his work. Can I say something about that guy? Yeah. About the uh, 
education piece, trying to express the, the life soccer piece, the, the interchange between the uh, student and the instructor is, 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 is two ways. To yeah, work. right. And uh, the way Paolo basically took that dichotomy is by saying that people who had university education or domesticated education were teacher teacher learners, and they were also learning too, and that the student, so-called students were learner teachers. So that, yes, it was in fact two-way, but that the student, or in his case, what he was talking about was basically teaching people who are in extreme poverty in Brazil, in the favelas, we call them ghettos, but their word for it is favelas, they had a working knowledge of how to survive that was not taught in school. The way I usually talk about it in a drug context is, you know, yeah, I'm a black science nerd, so I know neurotransmission and science and medical science that I've learned from school and my home training, but that's different from street knowledge. Because I haven't ever had to be street because of my social class. It wasn't necessary. Right? But I have to know about what's going on in the street to be able to reach at former addicts and gang members and get them to transition into a more pro-social um, way of living. Or also, you know, people who are possibly targeted by the prison industrial complex, you know, how do you stay out of that? I actually had somebody come visit me who basically had, you know, had done a stretch in prison, had gotten out, had been out for years and years and years, and then basically got caught up in the system by what I refer to as the principle of a foolish associate is more dangerous than a determined enemy. Right? You have to love yourself enough to not be around people who don't love themselves. Right? So as I can, can I use you as a model? Sure. All right. So don't move. All right. Okay, you're in class when this is the con. Don't move. Okay, if I basic without touching you, say don't move for five minutes, that's kidnapping in Oregon. And you complain, I've coerced you. That's kidnapping. I don't even have to touch you and it's kidnapping. Okay? Now, if you use a stolen credit card and I know that it's stolen and I'm standing this far away from you, even if I don't get the proceeds, but I know that you're using a stolen credit card, I can be charged along with you as an accomplice. And do a prison stretch. This is what happened to this person. Now, he should have been a block away. He said, I know, you know, da, da. okay, yeah. So, he had taken this class too, and realized, wow, I just walked right into that. But he's able to get himself out by basically studying the books and all the other kind of stuff, and basically talking the same stuff, which we're going to be talking about today, right? So, knowing that, like, knowing that there are people in prison, that they changed the rules, he was supposed to do, not him, but somebody he encountered in prison was supposed to do a 10-year stretch, and is basically doing life because they changed the rules while he's in. So he's essentially doing life in prison because every time he comes up to the parole board, oh, we changed the law, so boom. Doesn't matter you've served your original sentence. Right? Could you repeat the foolish? A foolish associate is more dangerous than a determined enemy. So where I first encountered Paolo's work, uh, with, which is uh, was in uh, my consultant practice within uh, the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, doing culturally specific drug prevention. And 
for a while, the feds wouldn't let us talk about Freire because of the Marxism piece. It's like, okay, I'm firmly wedded to capitalism and making money, okay? They wouldn't teach them to you of all either. Yeah, okay, because now the analysis is correct. And it's not saying, he's not ever saying that a socialist, you know, he's not trying to lead a socialist revolution. He's basically questioning the emphasis of education system, all right? So what I was doing by, let's explain, there's three different senses that you can think of Jim Crow as, and they're all correct, but the one that most applies to your situation now is American apartheid. So that when, you know, I would want you to know the other things because so you can recognize them when they come up again, because they do come up again. Plus you, you've said that before. No yeah. Words. Yeah, but it always bears repeating, right? So pa Paolo's work is often in educational circles because he's an educator, but it's also in public health circles. Can you go back to slide, Corinne? Thanks. It's often used in public health circles to help transform societies by empowering the oppressed. So most often, one of the things that we're looking at, the reason I talked about the cocaine piece, where the current problem in America came from is not just simply drug dealing gangs. The drug dealing gangs are simply filling a market niche that was there before they even existed. And there's been a place in the infrastructure for drug dealing gangs in the United States for 170 years. And just been moved by successive, successive people. So how do they get out of that? Certainly not through the criminal justice system though the criminal justice system might have a hand in it. All right, so we live in a state of internal colonialism. Now, we might talk about ourselves as the land of the free, that is, in America, but we incarcerate the most number of citizens per capita of anyone in the so-called free world. Number one. We just got that in the last year, didn't we? Last year. Uh, last Five years. <laughs> so internal colonialism. So how that works, it's where your experience is colonized unless you resist it. So it's not just what's happening outside of you. It's also your experience is colonized unless you resist it, particularly if you consume media content without questioning it. You're almost taught that what you see on a screen overrides your internal reality. And it begins to program your internal reality. Yeah? We learned about dialectic. Is that not the lack of dialectic in the American society? Yes, directly. So a lack of dialectic. <laughs> right. We're not taught. Now, to have that dialogue or that questioning, we're not taught to do that in the form of education is domestication. In fact, where you hear that whole dialectical um, framework is often, again, within socialism because it came out of Marx. And what he was trying to question was, okay, the whole feudalism, like, where does our concepts of economy come from? And how do we, you know, overcome those? So what Marx didn't, what people don't talk about, especially Marxists don't talk about, Marxist was a white supremacist. So he's copying a model that was developed by indigenous natives in America that was observed by Europeans, and they called it socialism, which included women leaders who didn't believe in real estate. And the reason they didn't believe in real estate is because humans don't own the land. You can only own that which you create. Humans didn't create the land. They can't own the land. Therefore, there is no individual ownership, which was inconceivable in a culture that believed in real estate. Real estate literally means the king's lands. And this case basically came under feudal societies where, unless you were a noble, you weren't a citizen. You weren't even a person. You were a property. The king had the right, I mean, when we're talking about common law, that means 
If you're not noble, you're a commoner. So yeah, you could get married by shacking up with someone, but it was common law. It wasn't recognized by the church. You just lived together because you weren't a citizen. That's, and also, because you were the king's property, human beings were the king's property, the king had the right to sleep with your wife on your wedding night. Because he owned both of you. First rights, first night's rights. That's what that was. That's where the acronym for the F word came from. For, fornication under command of the king. Right? Hence its sexual connotations and its curse word. Because you can understand why people would, people would feel about the king had the right to sleep with my wife. F that. <laughs> right? So, real estate. The king's lands. Right? So the king owns everything and you, you got nothing. So Marx is, you know, rebelling against that. How do we change from that to what he called the primitive accumulation of capital that is slavery, where individuals who are not royal can purchase other individuals and thus accumulate wealth. The primitive accumulation of capital. He's not questioning it because he's also believing that non-whites are inferior to whites. So he's not even analyzing the problems of his own, think, his own thought processes. So, when we go back, go back to slide, if you would. So, we're living in the state of internal colonialism. So, for example, today, the IRS and the intelligence community, that is FBI, CIA, NSA, DOD, all the alphabet soup, focused on the left, no attention was paid. Now, why were they focusing on the left, having lived through that? We were talking about revolution. We, yeah, meaning me. Yeah, I have an FBI file, and I basically concluded, okay, you're going to kill Martin Luther King? Oh, then basically, it's on. Peaceful social change is not going to happen if you're going to, you know, even back then, because, you know, we thought we were paranoid, the government killed Martin Luther King? Well, that's crazy talk. So, I didn't even find out until doing an internet search three months ago, that there was a trial by the King family that proved in the court of law that the government actually had a hand in killing Martin Luther King. Like, wow, I thought that was crazy. But no, this caused a shift in my thinking, which is basically similar to the shift I already had. In 1968, if the government had a hand in killing Dr. King, then you're basically precluding any peaceful social change. Or what you're saying, if I still work for social change, that's a death sentence. If they found those note cards by J. Edgar Hoover, then we know a lot of stuff. We don't yeah. They disappeared, though. But in any case, the idea is, okay, I understand if I'm going to choose to work for pe peaceful social change, if I'm going to free people from addiction or other forms of oppression, that I might be considered an enemy of the state. So be it. Okay. So, so the IRS could focus on me as a target, or people like me as a target. I'm not talking about blowing stuff up. Look, look, I already made the point. If you think Microsoft is oppressive, do you think killing Bill Gates is going to stop Microsoft? No. It's already too big to do that. You have to change people from within, where the actual power always resided, where they don't want you to focus. I guess they think the Tea Party is a threat too. Well, the, the reason they're focusing on the Tea Party because the Tea Party focuses on, on anti-government rhetoric. They're basically saying the U.S. government currently is like the British, hence the identification. But having, since I haven't talked about this, this term, having had this argument with a Tea Party person who's actually from Boston, and I said, okay, so what was the original Tea Party? Uh, er, well, he didn't know. Wait, you went through Boston Public? Well, no, I didn't go to schools. I was already in the system. So I basically was educated by the system. Okay, well, here's the thing. The Tea Party was a revolt by white people against another set of white people 
where they dressed up as Indians because they feared reprisals by the British. And part of that meant is the reason that they could dress up as Indians because the British weren't going to come after the Indians because the Indians were a military power. So this is an argument between two, pe two different sets of white people and the Indians didn't believe in real estate and they didn't believe in taxes. But the Indians didn't care about British tea. So y'all are basically saying the government is oppressive, but what you need to do is follow the rules of the people that were here. Because And then he made, said something that was offensive, and this person is given to making lots of offensive statements in my presence, I guess, to test me. Anyway, he said, well, there was no civilization here. Okay, whatever. <laughs> right. And they, the English didn't think that you as an Irish person had civilization either. That's why you were brought here in chains. But, okay, that's still a lie. But, whatever. So, the Tea Partiers don't have that kind of historical analysis, nor do they believe in the culture that generated them and looking at the revolt. So, the problem isn't so much the U.S. government. It's basically a symptom of it, right? So, the Tea Party, back to slide, Tea Party focuses on anti-government rhetoric like the left used to do in the 60s. The government acts to protect itself, so naturally they become a focus. Duh! Okay, you talk about killing the president or, you know, you send it back to Canada, you know, whatever. You know, the infrastructure seeks to protect itself no matter who's in power. You talk against the government, <laughs> they're going to look at you. Duh! Why trip? Okay? So this is the crouching tiger. That is what you, you're focusing on what you th are immediately threatened out about, but you actually should be focused on the hidden dragon. But the hidden dragon has yet to be addressed or acknowledged, and we'll talk about that later, that image later. But that's one of the cultural reference of that phrase, not just the movie. Crouching tiger is the danger in front of you. Yeah, yeah, it's threatening. But what you should really be tripping about is the hidden dragon that you could also teach yourself to see, but is much more dangerous and much more powerful. But you ignore that. So internal colonialism. So colonization not only happens, as Fanon teaches us, by external control. Also, colonization by thought control. Not that they're controlling your thoughts, but controlling what you think about and focus on. Basically, thinking inside their box instead of focusing on your own constructed hypercube. And actually, to hear somebody who, just, who had gotten out of prison come back, yeah, thinking about making my own hypercube. Like, wow. I said that years ago. Yeah, you told me that. Think inside the hypercube. Wow, it's coming back to me. Okay, I'm going to use that today. So this is Freire. Inquiry and violence. To alienate people. I should have had this all in quotes, but this is Freire. So... To alienate people from their own decision-making is to change them into objects. Any situation where some prevent others from engaging in inquiry is a form of violence. So it's not just that you don't know, you're not able to have a dialectic. You're not even informed enough to have a dialectic. That's a form of violence. To not know that there is a box, that your box is constructed by somebody else, that you've accepted it as normal, because you can't think outside the box until you know that there's a box. Okay, and that's, Freire would basically say that's a form of violence. And Fanon would basically say that's a form of violence, but you think it's normal to be like that. It ain't. So this is out of the Pedagogy of the Pressed, which is on your book list. 
if you want to look at it further. Independence cannot be given as a gift. While no one liberates himself by his own efforts alone, neither is he liberated by others. Nobody can free you. You got to free yourself. Initially, the oppressed identify with their oppressors. So, for example, if given a bit of power, first the oppressed tend themselves to become petty tyrants. This is why revolutions fail. This is the principal way revolutions fail. You can get rid of your oppressors, but if you leave both the infrastructure that was kept the oppressors in power, plus the educational system that by which the oppressors maintained their power, and you don't question it, you're going to be just, you just switched <laughs> heads of state. And this is the thing that we'll look at because you know, if I were going to be co-contemporary with what's going on, what has happened in Africa in the 60s, 70s to the present day, this is part of the problem there. Their ideal is to be men, but for them to be men is to be oppressors. This is their model of humanity. They are, still, they are still identified with their oppressor's values. The peasant who becomes a foreman may be harsher towards the other peasants than the owner. The context of the situation remains unchanged. So there's not only a structure keeping people in place, but also a form, they've been educated to replicate the system and not imagine anything different. That's why the Bolsheviks had to use the ministers from rehire the ministers from the Tsar. Yeah. Oops. How do we do this? I was pretty surprised about reading from the Quino Pro like yesterday about how they explicitly said that they their like mission statement was basically to uphold the social and political um, order. Yeah, right. Yeah. To uphold it, not replace it, not transform it. To uphold it. Yeah. Okay. Prescription and freedom. So every prescription, like the oppressed prescription for the oppressor, imposes one person's choice on another and brings the consciousness of the latter into conformity with the former's views. This can be threatening because it would require the subservient to replace the oppressor's image of them with one that stresses autonomy and responsibility. So as an example, when, when Frederick Douglass says, power can seize nothing without a demand. Oppression brings a certain condition which the oppressed basically rightfully make demands for change. Well, this is threatening. However reasonable it might be. We're not questioning the power structure. Just ease up a little on this little area. These simple little changes. But that's threatening. The oppressed learn that without freedom they can't exist authentically, but at the same time they fear authentic existence. Now that's, we definitely see that within addiction, where people have become so comfortable with being strung out that they can't, re can't really imagine a clear, clean and sober existence. It's scary. That has become their identity. Same thing with oppression and colonialism. It's difficult to think of what being free is. Having your decisions made by yourself. This is also, we find this with people socialized within the prison industrial complex. They are more comfortable with being inside than making all these decisions on their own. Because we call them institutionalized. Right. 
that's, that's pretty interesting. I like. <clears throat> so you can relate that to uh, colonialism? Yes. Because, uh, you know, like growing up in Africa, um, we got independence in 1980 from the British, and then we had, we, then we had the indigenous president. You're talking about in Zimbabwe? Yeah. yeah. Mugabe. In yeah. yeah. Right. But uh, it, it just felt like uh, certain people didn't embrace the, the freedom of having uh, you know, a native president and just trying to build a nation within the domestic people. Right. And I mean, now, now I realize why it kind of... Yes, because even, you know, considering where Mugabe and lots of the educated people classes in your country were educated, yeah, educated. there is no place for questioning that colonization. There is, you, you may know about Great Zimbabwe, yeah. but Great Zimbabwe isn't just a building, no. right? It, re re it represents a form of cultural technology yeah. where the society was based on it. Nobody knows how to replicate that in the 20th century, nor did you have the value to do that yet. Right? It would take time to begin to do that. I have a Palestinian friend, uh, many people know him uh, as a restaurateur, Ib, Ib, Ibrahim Hamidi. Hamida. He's Palestinian, right? He was born on the West Bank, right? So Ib says, yeah, great. So, suppose we get the West Bank today. Uh, it still will take us 50 years to figure out what that means as a country. Because our entire identity has been fighting against Israel just like before there was an Israel, we were united with the Israelis in fighting off the British to get them out of Palestine. But then once they left, yeah. what does it mean for us to be a nation? It takes longer than at least 50 years to decide what your national identity is after you've gotten rid of your oppressors. And one of the things you don't want to do is replicate what the oppressors did. So how do, I mean, how do, you, how, how do people get away from that? Same thing as the LA gangs. Yeah, right. So the founding of the LA gangs was to found against the white gangs, and after there is no white gangs, they turn against each other. And it's complicated even more in, because we have to address the problem of sharing because Jerusalem is the capital. Yeah. And until that's solved, there will, until that issue is resolved, there can be no Palestine. The answer to your question is how do you do that? Yeah. to how you do it. It's, it's simple and it's complicated, right? So uh, there are models for how to do it, but the how to do it, it becomes the tricky part, right? Yeah. yeah. Too much to answer right now. Yeah, so. sure. <laughs> That's a whole other class. It's a whole other class, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just a painful thing to watch, though. Yeah. Because like, for me, I, I mean, I, I, I've traveled around Africa, and. You know, it's like the people feel like we were better when we were being colonized, you know. And, yeah, people and, think you know, that, right. But that's, that's not true, you know, but... Yes, things, yeah, the trains ran on time when you were, when you were colonized. So some, th some things were better, but... Other things are not, otherwise you wouldn't have fought a liberation struggle. Same thing with us, here in America. You know, I mean, the thing that I observe all being in Africa is it's different throwing the British out 50 years ago than 200. <laughs> oh, and now we're allies with the British? Well, that's kind of a dangerous thing, I think, but okay. Here we are, right? Well, that's the consequence of colonism. Yeah. What, what, what we struggle, what, why Africa struggle right now is the consequence of of dividing people. Yeah. So that's I mean that's why we I mean it's I mean if you see uh, the African continent as how much country there, how much border there, it's so complicated. I mean it's it's hard to deal with all ethnicities now that you have like same rate same I mean same reliance to tribes who who, be, who belongs to different countries. That's that's the trick of communism. Yeah. So, 
divide and conquer, you know. Hutu against Tutsi, Indibele against Shona against, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, sorry, but the Tutsi, and, uh, which is like one of the, the biggest genocides in Africa, yes. was, you know, basically caused, well, you know, when the Belgians came and they sort of like divided people into classes, mm -hmm. and then when they left, the, the Tutsis and the Hutus felt like either one was oppressing the other. And as a matter of fact, they were, they had divided them based on the the, the lightness of the skin, yes. the skin tone. Right. You know. And so afterwards, when the Belgians left, the local people felt like they had to deal with this problem, and then they massacred one another. Right. And then you have you know just like we have in Syria, basically the you know, an, a minority that's maintained itself yeah. in power with military force against a larger majority, which yeah. <laughs> rightly resents that that oppression, but how do you, you know, I mean, we've come, we've come to, you know, open shooting war, how does that get resolved? So the fearing the authentic existence. So there are conflicts between throwing out their internal oppressor or not, between being fully themselves or being divided, between being actors with choices or spectators who do as they're told, between solidarity and alienation. So he, you know, basically we have, this is what we've been talking about. This is, you know, and to basically put it into words helps you at least conceptualize what the problem is, but saying that the solution is simply unity is not enough because that's not an easy thing by itself. There has to be some basis for unity. It doesn't help when they sold off their whole infrastructure to multinational corporations. There is that too. For the oppressed, to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they need to, per, to, quote, perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but a limiting situation which they can transform. So part of that transformation starts internally. How do I imagine freedom and how do I practice freedom on my own? So part of that, and what Freire would say, suggests, just like the teacher was educated, but now can learn from the people who are students, theoretically, the students can educate themselves to be free and teach that freedom to the teachers. So part of that internal colonization starts with your own sovereignty and accessing your own freedom and being free within yourself and practicing that freedom in the places that you can control. Now, we will talk later about power itself. So, and we'll basically be using a construct that I decided, because I got really tired of this, okay, everybody's talking about power and empowering people and oppression, well, what, what kind of power are we talking about? So talking about elements in an atmosphere of power. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For the, that got doubled. The oppressor truly helps the oppressed only when he stops viewing them as an abstract category and sees them as unique persons who have been unjustly dealt with, deprived, and cheated. Now, that's the oppressor. The oppressed need to see themselves that way already. Already. Without the oppressor. And that's the tricky part of overcoming internal colonization. Is, I don't need you, actually. I don't need you to basically see, you know, see me as a unique person. Yeah, you dealt with me unjustly. Here's what justice looks like. I'm going to give the justice to myself. And maybe not tell you about it. Because that might give you an idea that you can take it from me. So, get your own justice, your own education. 
This requires an end to pious individualistic gestures and risking an act of love. To affirm that people should be free and yet do nothing tangible to make this affirmation a reality is a farce. So the idea that the problem means empowering a few token individuals or basically doing a single act or a single thing and risking an act of love. So an act of love, what he's talking about um, is affirming that there's a connection, which is not necessarily in a Marxist analysis. So the dialogue. To substitute monologue slogans and com communiques for dialogue is to attempt to liberate the oppressed with the instruments of domestication. This is the populist pitfall, transforming them into masses which can be manipulated. So monologue, one person talking. Slogans. If you're not with us, you're against us. Don't tread on me, Tea Party for dialogue is an attempt to liberate the oppressed with the instruments of domestication. So part of domestication, and when we think of domesticated animals, we think of animals that don't think for themselves, that are basically exploited for whatever their internal treasures are, their meat or their milk or whatever, whatever their products are, their honey, their whatever it is. Right? Rather than being wild, or you have to go into their environment and deal with them. So populists often make this, you know, basically, on the, in the illusion of freeing people, you just create more masses that you're manipulating without freeing, and you become just like the oppressor. It becomes another form of oppression. This is another pitfall of revolutionary struggle. Because then, people have the illusion they're following a more progressive leader when actually they're not necessarily going to be free at the end of this process. People can only be liberated with their reflective participation in the act of liberation. Reflective means they have to be able to think. Not make snap decisions. Be able to think about what the process is and make choices. Reminds me of how Marcus Garvey spoke. Yeah. Because he would explain things, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't like a slogan like change or like something like that. Right. He would actually explain the uh, issues and all that. Yeah. And um, I'd say one of his most active and successful pupils, Malcolm X, basically did the same thing, basically used these analogies. But again, not just to emulate those people, but to internalize what they do and practice it yourself. Who are your role models? If there is a role model for you, how do you bring out your inner Angela Davis, your inner Harriet Tubman? I like when Dead Prez says, you know, food is the last plantation. Now, as a drug counselor, oh, food is a drug. Fast food is a drug. Fast food is not, is not nourishing, it's basically keeping you in a state of oppression and addiction. Sugar. Sugar and salt, essentially. Sugar is a political weapon. Yeah. <laughs> Sugar is political. It is, because of the history. If you understand in the 17th century, 19th century, 20th century, well, 17th and 18th century, the whole colonial system, sugar was oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The new oil is going to be water. The new oil is going to be water, right. Watch how that shifts to that. Well, some scholar related to uh, the civil war to sugar. Yeah, yeah. sure. Sugar and cotton, commodities, controlled commodities, and the labor to produce those commodities. Which happens, like, even nowadays in a lot of third world countries, like, like the, I think, Central and South America, where people are getting paid, like, very low 
slave wages, and it's one of the most dangerous jobs to this day, as far as I know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely up there. Even working in the clothing factory seems to be dangerous today. <laughs> especially in Bangladesh. Well, especially in Bangladesh, yeah. Let's see, I think. So, in traditional education, kind of the form of the model that we're following. There's a narrator, the storyteller, that is the teacher, and a listening object, the students. So, education is suffering from narration sickness. This minimizes students' creative power and serves the interests of the oppressors who care neither to have the world revealed nor to see it transformed. Now, yeah, we're using the form of domesticated liberation, but we're having a liber liberative discourse. That is to say, look, I expect to qu be questioned as I questioned. You should question authority, but when you question authority, make sure you have the answers first. Like you notice with my tests, Okay? Of course I have the answers first, but I'm willing to accept multiple answers if it fits the question. So, and I've changed that process. Not just one correct answer, but it, where there are multiple, because, hey, there are multiple answers. And that came about because of student interaction. A lot of these, que a lot of these questions on these tests are interpretive. Yes. Right. Everybody has a different background and a different way of looking at things. That's right. They react almost instinctively against any experiment in education which stimulates the critical faculties of students and is not content with a partial view of reality. Right? So that's the oppressors. Domesticated education. That's why ethnic studies is so dangerous. That's why, you know, Arizona attempted to, well, they did eliminate it, but that doesn't mean that it isn't happening in the community. So, banking model of education, which is usually, if people have heard about Paolo Freire, this is usually how they've heard about it. So, in a banking, in a bank, what, what is a bank? Besides the geographical part of a river. What is a bank? Depository for money. Depository for money. Can you mint your own money? Well, I'm a printer, so I guess I could. I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> Can anyone mint their own money? Legally. Legally. <laughs> no. Yeah, there are some really good copiers that can print currency and they've basically done things to try and foil that fact, but, okay? So, in what Freire is talking about is knowledge in domestication knowledge is minted. Okay? So there's legitimate knowledge that is the knowledge that supports the system of oppression and there's illegitimate knowledge which actually may in fact be older. It might be the indigenous point of view, knowledge of indigenous cultures. It might precede the system. It might be replicated uh, in people's life ways. Notice I didn't say lifestyles. Lifestyles are choice, life ways are followed, followed because they're your survival mode and have been for millennia. Okay, so in the banking concept, then, banks are repositories 
places that it's held, repository for legitimate knowledge. And so school then becomes the collection of all the legitimate knowledge. And so then, only somebody who's gone through the legitimate knowledge process can impart to you the passive objects to be filled up with knowledge, and then you regurgitate it, educational bulimia we sometimes call it, and then eventually you graduate with your robes, and then you become, you get your sheepskin, because it literally was a sheepskin, given by the monks, and then you become an acolyte of legitimate knowledge. Right? Pretty straightforward, right? 